Um, and before we begin, I want to thank the sponsors who have made this webinar possible. So if you see these folks around in the industry, please thank them and please also consider supporting them. Without them, A3 couldn't do our work and we couldn't hold events like this tonight for the community. Uh, and with that, I'm going to introduce our host for this evening's panel, uh, Lori Delaney. Lori, if you want to raise your hand, uh, is leading us here this evening. Lori began her career working as a lift operator at Snowbird. After one season, she transitioned to ski patrolling, where she discovered her interest in learning as much as she could about avalanches. After a number of years on patrol, in 2014, Lori started working for the Utah Department of Transportation on the Little Cottonwood Canyon Highway Avalanche Forecasting Program, where she's been working full-time ever since, with the occasional stint as a part-time patroller whenever it works out. UDOT currently utilizes Gazex, Obelex, and VEASAN Towers in its RACS program. So as we were considering hosts for this evening, Lori was the first person to come to mind as a great one. And we're really thrilled to have her. So Lori, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions and roundtable. Cool. Thanks, Janie, for that. Um, so just so everyone knows kind of how this uh, is going to work or how we hope it'll work. We're not really going to give, you know, a detailed account of how each system works. We'd like to more talk about, you know, considerations for implementing rack systems, pros and cons for different types of racks, things like that. Um, so hopefully most of you, if you're joining us, you kind of have an understanding of how most of these systems work. That being said, if you don't, you know, you can ask questions at the end. Um, we will have a 30 minute window at the end for questions. So if you have a burning one, you can throw it in there, but primarily we'll address those at the very end. Um, and we've got a range of topics uh, that we will address and that'll hopefully, you know, get some good conversation going with the panelists all of whom have a lot of knowledge and experience with these various rack systems. So yeah, I think you'll get a really good understanding of uh, how a lot of these systems work and hopefully some insight into you know, deciding what's best for you, if anything. So with that, I will introduce our panelists here. So we will start with Jamie. Jamie Yount, you wanna raise your hand there? Yeah. So Jamie is a meteorologist and avalanche forecaster with 20 years of operational avalanche experience in the transportation industry. Originally from Bozeman, Montana, Jamie spent 15 years in Jackson Hole as an avalanche technician for the Wyoming DOT before moving to Colorado in 2017. Jamie has worked for CAIC as an avalanche forecaster and is now the winter operations manager for the Colorado DOT. Thanks for being here, Jamie. Um, and CDOT operates Gazex, Obelex, Avalanche Guard, and Beeson Tower rack system. So he has done it all. Matt McKee, welcome. Good to see you. Matt actually hired me into the program. So longtime mentor. Um, Matt McKee is the Avalanche Program Manager for the Alaska Railroad, where they currently have two Avalanche Guard towers protecting a remote section of track. Matt also spent 14 years working for the Utah Department of Transportation, where he gained firsthand knowledge of the planning, installing, maintaining, and usage of Gazex, Obelex, and Vison Tower systems. Alaska Railroad has recently acquired a Federal Railroad Administration grant to install six towers to excuse me, protect a section of rail that connects the Whittier to Anchorage. So Matt McKee also pretty much does it all. Um, Pete Groves, hello. Hello. Grovesy is a uh, close coworker of mine. We work together pretty regularly uh, between Alta and the DOT up here in Little Cottonwood Canyon. So great to have you up here. Um, Pete Groves showed up at Alta for the 1987-88 year and never left. He has been on the ski patrol since 1993 and for the last five years has been a supervisor in the snow safety program. Groves has spent a lot of time shooting avalanchers, cutting his teeth under the guidance of legends like Daniel Howlett, aka Howie. 
Alta currently uses VEASAN towers and Obelexes for rack systems. Awesome, thanks, Grozy. Ken, great to see you. You too, Eric. We haven't gotten to interact as much, but uh, you have a long uh, career in California and you know, you're gonna make it through this winter somehow. That's right. <laughs> So Ken Boakland began, began backcountry skiing in 1986 and ski patrolling in 1991. He is currently a trainer with AUNAC for the use of military weapons and avalanche mitigation programs. Ken is an alumni snow safety team member at Alpine Meadows and part of the avalanche mitigation team for Union Pacific Railroad. Ken recently retired as the ski patrol director for Alpine Meadows ski area in Lake Tahoe. Palisades Tahoe currently only uses the Gazex rack system, but has plans to expand with other systems in the future. All right, so those are our panelists with a wealth of knowledge. And yeah, maybe we can get started. I don't know if one of you wants to jump in or, you know, maybe the first topic, um, considerations for rack systems. So, you know, you've got something in place or nothing in place and you're considering a rack system and you know what was the previous option um is the system appropriate for where you're considering and then what are some of the difficulties that could come you know maybe let's just start with if you're considering a rack system what are some of the things that are going through your heads could I could I jump in there, Lori? I think yeah. like for us, um, we originally started considering rack systems for worker safety because mm -hmm. we had some ski patroller deaths. So, um, you know, for us that worked out pretty. You know, it's worked out pretty well for for worker safety and operational considerations with keeping roads open, access to the upper mountain. Um, so I just kind of wanted to throw that out first and foremost, you know, we, we all put ourselves on the line, you know, doing what we do. And I think uh, these rack systems, you know, are, are definitely the future as far as like helping, you know, keep us a little safer. Yeah, so that's a huge benefit having that remote system as it states so that you don't have workers in the field at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think for us, you know, we started with the Obels and sort of some small targets, small starting zones that we uh, consistently shot with an avalancher. Um, and so it was kind of a good place to start. It was this place where uh, main traverse was. It was nice to be able to have it open all the time. We could close and fire these Obels off quickly and reopen. And so that kind of brought the, the Obels to Alta really with the help of Howie in the beginning. And then, you know, the Vizans were, re a lot of the Vizan work was sort of, part of it was, you know, expanding the Rex program, but also the, uh, the end of the Howitzer program as well. I think those two kind of coincided to kind of get us on the road to, to Vizans. Um, and yeah, worker safety and the, and the avalanche and the mis the unfortunate couple of accidents that have occurred um, is surely a good reason to uh, to go that way, for sure. I think, although I will say I'm a, still a big fan of avalanches, but I think that was kind of the motivation for the racks, um, the safety, the simplicity of firing them, um, their effectiveness. All those things are, are, are strong points of them for sure. They do involve helicopters, which are expensive and, you know, a presence to be met, dealt with for sure. Um, you know, here in Colorado, when I'm looking at putting in a rack system, like I kind of consider a lot of different things. Um, the terrain's really buried here and uh, I think for me, the access is really a big consideration. So do I want to be, is, and, and the number of shots that I can get out of the system, you know? So like, do I want to do something that's like fixed in place where I need to get there and go there and maintain it on site? Or do I want to do like a tower-based 
a tower-based system like a VSIN or an Obelix that I can use the helicopter to bring it down to where I have my tools and supplies, you know? And then, and then the number of shots is pretty important for me because the logistics of doing a reload are pretty, they're just, they're, it's just a burden, you know, on top of everything else we've got to do in the winter time to like coordinate a helicopter mission. I, you know, it, it, it's just, and, and a road closure to support that and like everything else, it's, it's just a logistical challenge. And so um, we're all about reloading if we need to and shooting when we need to. And, but, but if I can avoid that challenge, I'm going to try and find the system that's got enough shots to get me through. So like looking at the data and figuring out what the return interval is and the number of missions we've done in the past and what's the best fit here and, and, and our, how are we going to maintain this thing and how are we going to get there? And, and, and so those are like, those are big things for me. Um, that maintenance piece is a big one for me. So, and, and the access, you know, cause once you build it, then you got to maintain it, you got to own it and you got to run it for, for a long time, you know? So uh, putting it something in there that's going to be easy to, easy to manage and maintain is, is a really uh, a, a big one for me. Cause our, our sites are really, a lot of our stuff can be really remote and really hard to get to. And, and, you know, going there in the middle of the winter can be really dangerous, you know, just like to go there and maintain or like an antenna is broken or a battery or something and you got to be there to fix it is like, can be really dangerous place to get to. And so, you know, that worker safety thing is super important to me. And, and so that's a big, a big one for me too. I also think, Jamie, too, the uh, um, historical data on, on the sites, you know, like, when you're considering these rack systems, you got to put them in the right spot because they're you're not moving them around, you know, once they're in, whether it's a Wiesen Tower or Gazex or well, Blaster Box, you have some, you know, the, the Avalanche Guard, you have some mobility there, you know, where you're going to lob shots. But, uh, you know, I think it's really important that people are considering these rack systems to have good historical snow depth data, um, where the cornices build out, you know, we're losing um, some of these, we're losing some of these Gazex stuff just because of snow. Um, you, know, you know, this this year is, you know, pretty extraordinary with, with snowfall. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big consideration too, just having, you know, not, not just a few years of data, but like really diving deep into where you want to put these things. They're really expensive. Yeah, it's, the site visit piece is like really important. We're actually down here on Red Mountain Pass this week, like looking uh, for a project that's going to happen this summer. And this is my fourth trip down here to like evaluate the, the depth of the snowpack and like where the cornices are forming and where we're going to put these things. And two trips in summer, and this is the second kind of winter time trip. So hopefully we'll get it right. Matt? Yeah, well, like, like Jamie and uh, Kent were saying, um considering your terrain considering your history uh and considering your terrain you want to one thing to consider about which rack you want to get is how how big is your terrain you know where the the obelix is pretty great for a lot of shots in i'd say smaller terrain where putting those in big terrain they seem a little undergunned um so picking your your rack to fit the size of your terrain and um, looking at your history, like I'm running into an issue with placing towers in the spot where um, it's they're going to be effective, but I have a lot of terrain up above that's mellower terrain that doesn't usually avalanche, but it can. So I'm trying to place these towers where they don't get taken out. And like Ken said, where they're going to be effective and where they're not going to get buried. So we've been running um, a couple seasons worth of LIDAR scans to figure out um, where the snow's building, where it's not, and then running some RAMS modeling um, to make sure where I, I think I wanna put my towers, we run the modeling to, to kind of see what potential forces are gonna come upon those towers so they don't get ripped out. Awesome. Yeah, boy, yeah, boy a little different for us in that, you know, our, I, you know, I'm just dealing with, you know, Upper Albion Basin and the Collins Gulch. And we, we've learned that with the places we have already, 
uh, we, we kind of overlap of effectiveness and to the point where we can almost, you know, prolong our timing to reload because we can sort of shoot one one day and shoot one the, the other one the next day. We get a lot of good overlap with the 11 pounder. Um, so, you know, uh, Jamie, I was really impressed with your you saw talk this fall and the scope of the area you have to cover. And it's really not like that for us at all in Alta. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a really a different scenario for us. And we are losing one Obel to do the snow depth, but we haven't had a decent shot touch the snow yet. We have a couple spots that are maybe getting close, but we haven't had that problem yet. That's yeah. A challenge here in Colorado, like our stuff is spread out. Like um, I'm based in Golden. Most of our stuff is in the I-70 corridor, but we do have equipment that's like five hours away from us, you know, and that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and that was, you know, I think a really huge thing, and and you nailed it, Jamie, in terms of, and I'm sure Matt may be most similar as well, just, you know, what's the difficulty in maintaining these things and, you know, beyond just the planning and you've, <clears throat> you've made your decision, great, but yeah, you have to live with it, and so that's that's a huge part of the planning process because they are expensive as uh, you guys have noted. And so, you know, maybe that's the next thing that you guys could touch on, you know, as well in your considerations, whether you're able to build in that redundancy or not, because, you know, you have to cover a big broad area, but your budget is only such. Um, and, you know, then, beyond that just the maintenance costs you know if if you guys are willing to touch on some of what you guys have to go through with the initial costs and then continuing costs i i could speak to gas extra palisades at least on at least on maintenance costs um redundancy i think is a whole a whole different topic but uh um for Palisades, we're budgeting $32,000 a year just in helicopter time. And that's to support um, nine shelters with 16 exploders. And of course, you know, those, those, those costs fluctuate. They're not going down, that's for sure. Um, most of our daily labor is sort of baked in, you know, because it's ski patrollers going out and, and, and doing the maintenance. Um, you know, MND safety has been, uh, in my opinion, pretty good. You know, I, I'm I, I'm not going to throw anybody on the bus. You know, Brandon Dodge is a good friend of mine, and he's helped me out immensely. We started these projects in 2014-15, um, and they offer some some good maintenance options. But uh, one of the analogies, uh, you know, that he told me was, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you have a car at a certain point, you got to change your own oil, right? You know, and, unless you opt in for these for these more costly maintenance programs that these manufacturers might offer. Um, so yeah, it's, ex it's expensive. They're all expensive. They all take, um, as far as I know, they all take helicopter time, unless you could drive to them. Like if you have, if you have a, um, a highway or a ski area that, um, where there's an avalanche path that you, you know, that you could drive to for construction or for reloading, you know, that, that certainly, brings the cost way down but but the helicopter time is a big one yeah we are we're budgeting in a hundred thousand dollars per year to support all our rack systems and we're at after this summer we'll be at 52 things out there hmm. in the world we have to support and then like uh i mean we have we have 16 obelixes and we need to we need to change the batteries in our obelixes so that's like you know, 16 12 volt batteries, and then there's a auxiliary battery as well. So that's 32 batteries. So that's like ten thousand dollars in batteries um, every maybe five years. So uh, yeah, those they make, they're they're expensive to build. They're expensive to operate. I think is the real. And then Jamie, would you say like about a twenty year lifespan on these before you do a total like a pretty big refurb? I think that's probably true. You know, I started at Wydot and there's a Gazic system there that we built in 1992. 
we pretty much, we didn't, I didn't like replace everything with that system by the time I left in 2017, but most of it. And then um, the folks that came after me kind of finished off that job and replaced everything. And so I think they pretty much have a new system and they did just do a brand new shelter even, which is like the third shelter for that, um, mm -hmm. that setup. So I think that's a good maybe metric. I think you could probably squeeze a little more than 20 years if you are like really good at taking care of it, you know, and like keeping up with it. Um, if the concrete has a lifespan, the, the, the steel, you know, these things explode for a living, you know, it's like a, maybe a, a tough, uh, a tough environment. Um, so, but yeah, probably 20 years, but, but that white art experience, I think 1992 to, you know, to now, so it maybe even stretched it out to 30, almost 30 years with a couple of the pieces of that Gazak system. But the Gazak systems have definitely gotten better than that original 92 uh, set up, but yeah, I think 20 or 25 years is a good, a good entry. I guess we'll all find out, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing a, a refurb this summer of uh, our avalanche guard. And it just seems like those systems that live out on the mountain year round, uh, maybe it's the summertime, all the sun they're getting, but they seem to get pretty crispy. Um, you know, there's, it's still working great, but it, it doesn't seem like it will be working a lot longer if I, if I don't get up and take care of it soon. Yeah, you know, we like with the Oblacks, we fly them down, we like, we store them inside, try and like get, take good care of them. Same with our decent boxes. So it'll be interesting to see if those, if we can stretch some more life out of those and compare yeah. to like the same mapless fixed in place systems that are just out there in the elements 24 7. So, Jamie, you fly those, you fly the Wieson um, turrets down and store yeah. them in the summer. Mm -hmm. Yep, fly them down. I mean, one of our big concerns in Colorado is lightning. And so I just don't want my my very expensive thing up there on the mountain for monsoon season and lightning. And so we just like getting them off the mountain. And then they're, you know, we can maintain them, we can service them, we can unload them, and then just you know start as, start off with them on a good footing the next year. And we have a pretty good we have a pretty good startup procedure, I think, that's working good for us. Um, like with the Obelexes, for instance, you know, we'll pull them out of storage in the fall. Get them out there in the field full of gas and just sit them in a parking lot and let them run, you know, and check comms and check gas levels and just like really be hyper diligent, and make sure they're like running well before we fly them up um, on the mountain. And so, so I like that kind of um, that shutdown procedure, I think is really a good one too, even with the fixed in place stuff, you know, however that might be for a Gazex or Avalanche Guard where you've got a shutdown procedure. And then um, we typically, we'll typically check them a little bit over the summer and we got maintenance scheduled. Um, and then we have a pretty good startup procedure for everything too, which I'm sure, I'm sure everybody else has something like that. And then we just know we're starting at like a kind of a really good baseline or, or hoping to like start at that really good baseline and go into the season with confidence as best we can, but you never know. Yeah. <laughs> And Jamie, there was just one request um, from a listener saying that your audio is a little low. If there's any way to turn your mic up or if that's. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, that's great. Um, maybe the next thing we could dig into is because I think this is obviously the the big thing with these things, as someone said, you need the helicopters and they're expensive, but you know, if you're considering going into a system, that's probably really important to know what your resources are there. So, you know, maybe you guys can speak to a little bit of, of the resources you have, if you've managed to develop new resources that way, um, you know, just, letting folks know what they should, what they should expect or, or not. Does that I, make could, sense? I, I could jump in there a bit with, with Gazex that we, things that we've learned since 2014, um, as far as having your own resources and 
um, we use a lot of super 88 tape. We, we crank down, you know, this is high altitude plumbing. We crank down everything. A lot of it has to do with the install. Um, if you're looking at snow creep, knowing your historical data, um, we have a lot of water in California. I think we had 77 inches so far this year. Uh, snow creep and the way these lines are installed are a huge issue. Um, I, I think we've mitigated that over the years after having a bunch of failures. We have come up with a our own little um, handheld um, compressor that we bring. We, we pressure test all the lines every year beginning of the season and have lots of fittings on hand. Um, the Caltrans guys got a big stash of stuff. Brendan Dodge has a big stash of stuff. So um, those types of preventive maintenance issues, especially on the build. I would imagine, um, you know, I, I can't really speak to um, Avalanche Guard or Obelix. Um, they're tower mounted systems that everything's internal, but the, uh, you know, with Gazex, when you're running lines all over the place, it really um, would behoove you to, you know, be really hammering on the contractors, be there on site, looking at, you know, where these things are, can we get things underground? You know, how does it all come together at the exploders, you know, with, with um, considerations of snow creep and, and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, and out there we did our own obo install, um, having, having roads to drive up and get pretty close to your sites. Um, parking a compressor on the road and running a long length of hose and then flying all your tools and drills up there. As long as you find a big chunk of rock and use the template that Obel gave you, MND gave us, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, and I think that saved Alta a lot of money. Um, it's not the case with Wiesen. Um, Matt Riesling does a really good job. He has a great crew. He has a great procedures and he brings in his own drillers they do a little more tricky sort of horizontal drilling that we weren't up to but uh yeah installing the obels was was, was pretty easy really as far as that goes just had to find some good rock and uh it went pretty well and we haven't had any issues we haven't had any concrete crack um we only had one tower get damaged because it got completely buried we had to pull the bell off and then just the creep on the upper nest that holds the bell, I just think pushed on it too hard and tweaked the base plate. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how, how, how we did it with the O-bells. Cool. And, um, you know, I guess it'd probably be safe to say as well that if you don't have good access with helicopter companies that are close by also um, that you might reconsider if that's the appropriate system for you and and or if there's a system that could function through a longer period like you were saying Jamie because of your difficulties with maintenance and and distance etc yeah hey can you hear me better or hear me no better, yeah. okay cool yeah, you know, one thing for us that we've, right, so you, you you figure out what system you want, you build it, and then, you know, we're pushing more to these tower-based systems because they're, they're so much easier to bring on the ground and do what we need to do. But now we got we to gotta establish a helicopter LZ. Um, you know, a lot of our stuff's pretty remote. We might not have a lot of infrastructure there to, to support it. How do we, like, we're, for instance, we're looking at a VEASAN install. Um, and you know you have to load the box and once you load the box you want to just get it on the tower because you don't want it on the ground you don't want it's not a magazine we don't you know so so how do we do that on the side of a road um right so we've had to kind of think about the logistics to support these these setups and so like for that VEASAN uh potential VEASAN project in the future right so we we're thinking oh well so if we had an enclosed trailer and we build the we build the shot and the closed trailer and then we have like a deck over trailer and we have the boxes on there and then you're you're going through the same procedures you would um but you're building a shot in a nice a nice as best we can climate controlled environment and we're bringing it out and doing all the qa qc and we're loading the box on the 
the deck over and then the helicopter when we're ready can just pick it off the deck over. So, so those are those are some of the kind of unique challenges that we've been trying to think through um, in Colorado and some of these remote places and where we've, you know, historically just pulled over to the side of the road with a howitzer and set it up and fire in the hole. Um, it's, it's kind of a new logistical ch challenge, which is, um, which has been interesting, but it's something to maybe consider, right? When you're, when you're looking at these systems, it's like how you're going to support it and what, what that looks like. The Obel's pretty easy to fly down, swap out bottles, maybe not all that kind of stuff on the side. So the VEASAN's been a bit of a extra learning curve in some of these places for us. Yeah. And, you know, fair enough, Jamie. I mean, we had the same challenges in Alta, only it's different in that we have, we have to use one of our two main parking lots to fly out of. Um, right. We have to have that parking lot totally cleared by 915 for the scheme public. I mean, we envision a complex somewhere where we can have a powder cache, a makeup room, and a helipad where it can all happen in one place away from these, you know, super crowded public parking areas. And we have some ideas of things you might be able to do, but that, you know, that's something we're definitely working on trying to establish as we add more and more visa boxes to the program, you know, doing as much makeup with shots as you can in the summer, wine racking them, having them ready to go. So that in the morning, you know, I mean, it's light at 730, you have till 915. That's a lot of work to get your shots down, get them capped and fused, get them inspected, get them in the boxes, do your checks, get the helicopter in and out. It gets a little hectic with, you know, the plague of humanity running all around the upper Little Conway Canyon. It's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a big challenge and a, and a safety concern for us. So, I mean, it's kind of a different scenario, but it's the same kind of idea for sure. That's, that's interesting, interesting, Grovesy, because we're parallel. We're thinking of the same thing here in Alaska, at least uh, South Central between the railroad, the DOT, and the Alaska ski area, combining to make a uh, kind of a, a racks base where we can have magazines and, and uh, a helipad and uh you know like a quonset shed where we could store these and 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 load them up uh where it's nice and dry that gives us our table of distances to be able yeah. to do that it's tricky but we we've yeah. identified a few spots and luckily uh for heli time it's pretty close to a lot of our potential rack locations but i think that'll be really important and it's you know when Lori was talking earlier about things to consider that's one that kind of creeps up with uh, when you're planning these things is where are you going to store all your explosives, especially when you're transitioning from artillery because you can't mix your artillery explosives with your other high explosives. So you got to have two two magazines now where you might only had one before. Another thing too that people need to, to think about when they're talking about heli time is if, if you're flying explosives, um, well, and gas too. I mean, it has to be a hazmat certified heli operation. I mean, we all have them, but I mean, if you're new looking at that, mm. it's not just anybody that could fly explosives. Long line, good long line pilots. And another thing about helicopters, you know, in Alaska, it's less of an issue. Um, but, you know, because because we're at lower elevation, it, it felt like in Utah, on some of these questionable weather windows, the the B3E was, you know, giving it all all it had to mount these on the towers if if it was questionable winds. Where, you know, if you're even higher up like you in Colorado, Jamie, I bet sometimes it's 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 not as easy. No, man, we use strictly use the Huey for our sites. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, we're having good luck with the B3E as long as it's cold. But um, I feel like sometimes I feel like what we're asking these guys to do is like totally insane. Um, <laughs> and um, and we're lucky to have a really good vendor here and good pilots, but really trying to find that good window. And But yeah, our, our starting zones are at 
over 12,000 feet for the most part. So we're, we're kind of operating at the limits yeah. of what the B3E will do. And then, uh, and then when it's, when it's hot, then we're just going straight to the K max. Yeah. We, uh, we top out under 4,000 and we're usually not too hot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, funny note about the altitude here. Like we got the we got our avalanche guards a few years ago, and we had the firing tables, which apparently were uh, tested at like five thousand feet elevation. And it turns out when you uh, use that same powder at twelve thousand feet, those things you really get some distance out of those things. <laughs> those pucks are throwing them. Up. Yeah, so we a uh, <laughs> bit of a revision there. Right. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. I think that's super important. You know, it's easy to think it's no big deal. We'll just fly the thing with a helicopter, but you know, helicopters are, they're crazy aircrafts and you know, a lot of exposure is every time we do something, especially this season where we've done it a lot, um, I'm always crossing my fingers because you never know what's going to happen. Um, so maybe, you know, Ken, I liked your point of, uh, you know, being proactive especially with the installation and everything and and trying to take ownership of your stuff and come up with your own resources and that's like something we all try to do but i think maybe talking about the different companies that support these systems and what you want from them what you don't want from them um I think that's a really valid thing to consider. Maybe you guys can chime in with your thoughts on that. Um, again, again, you know, since we're Gaza specific, um, I could chime on that for sure. Uh, I, I think it all comes down to like very specific communications and contracts of what it is um, that a company can offer and what it is the client wants and expects. And that uh, where you run into issues is um, when things aren't communicated directly and it isn't just 100% laid out, you know. Um, Gazex has been around a long time and all these, you know, everyone here on this panel and um, a bunch of people that aren't could, could attest to the, to the issues that, that we've had with Gazex. But that being said, they, they've also evolved um, the shelters are different, you know, I mean, it, it's been around a long time. So I, for me personally, um, what I want in a, in a, in a, you know, client relationship is just transparency. This is what we could offer. This is, you know, um, and what it is, what is it that you want, you know? So are you able to do some of the maintenance yourself or do you want to have you know, as a, as a manufacturer come in and do everything for you, is that even possible? Um, which it really isn't, you know, because we live in these environments and these companies um, aren't based, you know, in Colorado, you know, Utah and California. So I think it's just transparency and, and having hard conversations and sitting down and then, and, and evolving the system as you move forward, as it, in a relationship with the manufacturers. I mean, my two cents. <laughs> I think that's really well said, Ken. I, I think they all have a bit of a different business model or a very different business model. You know, um, VEASAN's very, you know, there's a, there is a contract, an annual contract with a VEASAN set up, you know, that, but you get, I feel like you get a lot for your money. You know, you get that yeah. customer support, you get, you get a quite a, you get quite a bit for that. And I appreciate that. And we have a lot of Gazex equipment here in Colorado. We've got a, we, it's been a strained relationship at time. You know, that transparency has been not there at times. Um, I think it's improved. I think they want to be better. They want to, they want to be, um, and, and they're working on it, but, uh, uh, I've worked with Gazix for a long time and it's, we still haven't, I feel like we still just haven't gotten there, you know, and, and, and I think they've made some, some pretty big strides, pretty big improvements. 
have a better presence than they've ever had. Um, but I'm still looking for that really good transparency from them at, at times. And I just want to know if there's an issue that we should be prepared for or not, you know, and, and that hasn't been always forthcoming. And we're under, a, we were all under a lot of pressure here to like keep these things have to work. You know what I mean? It's not like a weather station. You're like, Oh, it'd be nice to know what direction the wind's blowing, but Oh, well, um, like, these things have to work in a winter like this, where we're all like kind of maxed out uh, with day-to-day -day stuff, like um, the, the extra burden of racks issues is, is challenging. So, but I think that was a well said, Ken. I think like transparency and like collaboration and like being part of a team. And I think like, like talking through what you're gonna get for a warranty is a really important thing. And so that's clear and, um, and the roles and responsibilities between the vendor and and the and the owner are are clear is is just maybe a good exercise for everybody you know when you buy a system. Yeah, it's nice to know if the software is not going to work or it needs an upgrade or <laughs> or it's in French. Yeah. Plus, it's nice to know what you know emergency services. How quickly, you know, can they get to Alaska? If they, if there's something I can't fix, you know, how, how quick are they to respond? It seems like they're all trying to hire on more people and get more help for us, but I know it's been, uh, we've been running them pretty thin the last few years, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's some really good questions that have been popping up that we could maybe start into. Uh, I just had one more thing that I think would answer some of the questions um, and then we can kind of delve into that. But, you know, maybe you guys could touch on personnel needs for dealing with these rack systems. You know, they're, they're great in the moment, right? You push a button, ideally it goes off and you do your control work. But uh, I think it's, it's something for people to consider where, where are those personnel needs on the front side, on the back side, both um, man hours, et cetera. Maybe you guys could touch on that a little bit. I, um, I'll talk a bit about, uh, you know, um, personnel hours for, uh, for flying. Um, when we're flying Gazex, um, propane and oxygen, you know, it takes two people on the ground to hook it up. And then it takes two people at the shelter to unhook it and load it or hook it up and take it out. So if we're, if we're doing, um, I mean, just gotta do some quick math. So if we're doing nine shelters, that's 18 people at the shelters, unless you can move around, like if we're going to fly everything in one day, which we try to do, um, and then two ground crew. So let's see, that's 20 people for one, that one day of flying. And it's usually um, between Alpine Meadows and the Olympic Valley side of Palisades. It's an all day, it's an all day gig. gig. That, that's, you know, so it's, it's um, 20 people for eight hours, um, twice a year flying them up, flying them down. And then also um, just straight up maintenance usually takes, uh, I, I wrote this paper um, recently, um, depending on how far away your shelters are, you have to hike to everything, uh, especially in the summertime, can't ski there. With If you could, if it's an hour hike, um, usually one shelter with four exploders could be accomplished by a team of two in a day. So that's just summer maintenance. That's just checking the lines, you know, making sure everything's, that's aside from just um, flying things to and from. Yeah, I guess for me in the morning of reloading, you know, in our time window, we think we can do about five diesel boxes in the morning. Uh, providing we've done a little uh, preliminary makeup, putting together charge canisters and tying our strings, say that's already done. Then I need a cat driver and we have a big orange basket that sits on the blade of the cat. You can drive up to the cache. I need four patrollers to load up the basket. 
and then drive down to the cat shop. So I probably need one patroller per box. So probably five patrollers who have been trained in making up shots and then one person to do quality control checks. So it's probably six of us total, plus a snowcat driver for a, you know, a three and a half hour morning project to get five boxes down and reloaded and back up. I need the parking lot crew to mark off the parking lot for me and hold back the frothers yeah. driving right through. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know, it's a half a dozen of us for sure to do five. We figure five is our, is our max in our time window based on the setup we have now. And so far that's worked pretty good. We've been able to kind of keep everything loaded up and that kind of doing five at a time. Yeah, maybe similar here, experience here. Um, uh, except we're, you know, we're putting road closures in if we're flying anything above the highway, like we're setting it on a tower above a road, an Obel X or a VSIM, we're doing a road closure. So we got to put that in place. Um, VSIM box, I think probably, you know, minimum of five folks doing a load out on a VSIM day for us. We only have one site with VSIM. Um, and then similar experience with the Gazex, we typically try to run at least two to three people per shelter at a minimum, you know, to, to, to do a bottle swap. The one thing is we do have some really remote Gazex sites that are like kind of hard to get to and, and standard maintenance is one thing, but like troubleshooting is like, can be like a, a whole other thing. And if you're trying to troubleshoot a radio issue or, um, oh, hey, I brought a, and so we've gotten in the habit of just trying to bring everything because it never fails, right? You're up there and you're like, well, we have this, but now we have, um, it looks like this radio antenna cable is bad. And so now, but we don't know that. So now that's another, it's a whole other day to like go down, round up a cable. Oh, we put the wrong connector on the end. Whoops, so, you know, it's another day to come back. And, and so like chasing some of these, some of these troubleshooting issues can be really, really defeating but also like just a huge time vortex of, uh, of, of, of effort and, and just the remoteness and, and the, the hiking factor and the access. And then, and then God forbid it's the middle of winter. And now you're like, I'm scared to go there. Can we, uh, can we get a heli bombing mission? Cause I don't want to die uh, mm -hmm. on the job here, you know, so, or, or something to like protect, you know, some protection shots so we can get in there safely and, and do what we need to do, even if it is just like a battery swap. Um, um, so just some other things to add. With the with the avalanche guard box, um, it's not too bad. It's it's me and another guy, and in a day, you know, less than a day, we can do um, reload three boxes. So that's not too bad, um, and. What one interesting thing, Lori, reminds me about Little Cottonwood Canyon is after a while with all the Gazek systems, we uh, installed uh, LZ in pretty much every area so we could access them. And that's something to, to think about. You know, we could hike to all of them, but if it was in the middle of winter and we really needed to work on them and the avalanche hazard was high or even elevated, we needed to get there. So after after uh, a few systems got put in a few zones, we we went back and started installing LZs at all the all the Gazex locations. Yeah, that's been huge. We've been using them. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, well, if you guys are good with it, maybe I'll throw some of these questions your way. And uh, no, could we? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Can we talk about redundancy for a sec? Yep. Please do. Um, just curious as to what other, all the other folks are, are doing for that. I, I know what we're doing, which is avalanchers and some hand. <laughs> what? What, what are you doing up in Alaska for if when they don't work? Well, so the plan right now when the blaster box doesn't work, I go heli bombing. And obviously I can't do that in the middle of a storm. Um, so there's gonna be closures. Um, but the plan for these 
you know, my newer uh, racks are on really important shots, maybe overlap, like Grovesy was talking about in East Castle, where they they overlap, where if one doesn't work, the other one's going to probably take care of the problem. And then I think one of the questions we had was, how do you fix that, you know, if it, if it persists all season? Um, when I'm designing like a, a, a VEASAN tower zone, for about every 10 towers, I might install a tower in a spot that you might not normally put one, you know, like a less frequent. Mm -hmm producer something that maybe only produces every 20 or 30 years but I kind of act as a, it's like a working spare so instead of having a spare in your garage so if a VEASAN tower doesn't work you could fly it up and replace it you have a spare kind of living on the mountain that you can use but if uh, one of your main producers one of your main towers you use something malfunctions and you can't fix it you can swap it out with your spare and keep going and you're not you're not really going to miss it like a cardiff fork or cardiff bowl you know in little cottonwood canyon it's not you know if that thing wasn't there it wouldn't be the, the worst thing but if uh toledo bowl wasn't there you could swap it out with with cardiff and, and keep it and feel pretty good about it so that's kind of a redundancy and then i am working on with the dot here we are working with the faa and getting permission to uh, use drones to drop explosives. So we might be testing that here in a, a few weeks with permission from the FAA and the US Forest Service and got all our bases covered there, but that would be another um, way to back up the system. Again, it's not that different than heli bombing. You gotta have good weather, but it's a little bit quicker to deploy if, if all of a sudden your your rack doesn't work. I got it ready to go in the back of my rig. Got to stop by the cache and grab some explosives, but it's a lot quicker to deploy and take care of a problem. Yeah, I'd like to hear from Grossi on the uh, um, the overlap. I mean, because that's like when people are starting to think about putting in these, you know, putting in a bunch of racks, it seems like overlap would be now you're talking about a lot of exploders, you know, a lot of a lot of Weeson towers. Yeah, and I think it's just the nature of the eleven pounder. I didn't think we really didn't quite appreciate uh, the effectiveness of these things um, when we lay, did our initial layout, you know. But we quickly learned when we lit off a few that there was, you know, a, a decent amount of, you know, significant overlap. Uh, mostly within the storm, the recent storm and windblown snow. Uh, we haven't been fighting the facets too bad down here this year. And uh, and I think as we look at our, our, our second half of Baldy installation, I think there might be a little bit of overlap there too. Um, uh, so are, I, you, are you backing that, with, that up with the overpressure studies or you're just going by? No, we're just going by what we see. Yeah. We're just going by, yeah, we, we light off eight this morning and it cleans out a lot of the terrain at 35 would clean out. So we don't have to shoot 35. And that's maybe not what we had planned, but I think there's some benefit in that for us, for targets we shoot so much to have some overlap to buy us a little more time before we have to fly again. It's oh, yeah. kind of what, it's kind of what we've, we've found. Um, I guess you could do all your over studies and figure out, you know, your, your total cone of effectiveness and just rely on that one tower, but a little bit of overlap in a place as confined as the North Face of Baldy is, is okay by me. It's okay by me, you know. Um, I don't think it was something we planned though. I think it's just something we've seen the effectiveness of these things and what they're, we're up to, you know. Some people think we don't need this, that big a charge up there. Maybe it's too big a charge. And 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 did you see that? Did you see any of that overlap with the um, with the emulsion charges before you went to the penalite? Or we never we never dealt with the emulsions. Oh, you went straight to. We went yeah to when we Grom started bomb. the program. You know, Grom got together with Accurate and we had the eleven pounder made, and that's all we've ever used. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's 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 a fair question. No, it wasn't planned. We didn't plan for overlap, but we're definitely seeing it. Right. And widespread effectiveness. Really, really widespread. So yeah. And I think it's a good, even though you didn't plan it, it's a good plan, like you're saying. There is a lot of benefit to that. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. That was perfect. Thanks for uh, introducing that, Ken. Um, and I think this kind of touches on, I just have to do this because uh, we have Liam Fitzgerald watching this and um, yeah, the legend. Yeah. Um, so his mind. question was when racks were first being installed in Little Cottonwood Canyon, a big concern was having some way to control the avalanche path if the rack device didn't work. Is that still an issue? Is it an issue elsewhere? And I feel like you guys definitely touched on that. Um, anything to add? Anyone? I think for us, um, you know, some of the some of the racks that we put in were, you know, pretty pretty worker safety involved. And um, at least in my tenure, and I hope that it carries on beyond that. We will never put humans there again. Um, if if the racks don't work, we'll, we'll shoot avalanchers at them. And, you know, I know Peter still likes avalanchers. I, I, me personally, I think that's going a bit backwards. Um, but that's what we have available now, the technology that we have um, until that changes. Um, you know, we shoot plenty of avalanche rounds. I, I know Jamie is, has reduced his, maybe Jamie could speak to it on how much he's actually reduced his avalanche rounds um in colorado um so that's what we do you know we have we have these racks where hopefully no humans will have ever have to go back into um, we'll shoot avalanches if they don't work if if the avalanches don't work or something doesn't happen we'll close the road evacuate you know whatever it takes but um we don't want to put humans in those certain spots. And then within the ski area, we, we have the ability to do um, some avalanche stuff and hand charging if we can get there. Yeah, Colorado would be like the avalanche is a backup. I don't really like any of our redundancy options, but we have them. Um, but we basically went from shooting a couple thousand avalanche rounds a year to shooting a couple hundred with racks. A couple thousand is a lot of avalanche rounds. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of avalanche rounds. Awesome. Well, maybe Jamie, this could be a question for you. It sounds somewhat DOT related. This is from John Stimbaris. Hi, John. You've touched on maintenance yeah. costs related to equipment and helicopters, but how about labor? Are you adding FTEs specific to racks operations and maintenance or adding to your forecasters workload? Yeah, that's a good question. We're trying a few different things. You know, it's a, we have a unique setup here in Colorado. You know, we partner with the Colorado Avalanche Information Center and we're, we're trying to leverage that partnership to get some more help with maintenance in the summertime. We, you know, we're, we're building more, most of our efforts have been around the I-70 corridor, which is where myself and my team are located. And so we have pretty good ownership of that stuff, but we're building more in the Southern mountains and we're, we're a long ways away from that, you know, five to seven hours drive. Um, and so like those Southern mountains projects, we typically like we build them, we like support them we best we can. And then we like, we push those kind of local resources to take ownership of, um, you know, and then, and then, if there's something major or there's something tricky, you know, we can, we can get down there, but we're trying to really get them to, to at least understand the basics. And so we can get them on the phone. They can help us troubleshoot. We can work through the problems together and it's working pretty good. But um, um, I think adding more people to support these systems, because we will be at over 50 things by the end of this summer. And um and the big push into the Southern mountains, having maybe a local expert that can support that program is something we're really looking at. Um, but FTE is a really hard thing to add in state government. And, and that's just, it's just a really difficult thing. So it's more about kind of maybe leveraging the resources you have to support it the best you can for us. And then hopefully we'll maybe get another position at some point. 
I could see maybe having one position as to sort of oversees the whole program, but I just use ski patrollers. They can do anything if you train them right. And they're often eager to get involved too. So, you know, for me, I have plenty of workers to help me out. Just as long as you have a, a good supervisor doing checks on, you know, proper makeup of rounds, and then just keeping track of, you know, the system as you add more and the upkeep and the maintenance and the flying and the reloading and all that stuff. That surely is a task that's been put upon us here in the snow safety office. And we kind of share the burden of that. And so far it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, Grossi, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I think it's also an opportunity for, at least for the ski areas, because it's different, it's a little easier than probably the states uh, to utilize that expertise to help our guys get some more money and girls. Yeah. Hey, maybe a real quick question for the group. Like one thing we've, we've been like really big on is like we do this thing called weekly checks with all our rec systems, right? So every week we just, with the radio based systems, we have to like drive around and connect to them. You know, it's nice with the VEASAN with the cell tower, but we just got like really pushing everybody to make sure these things are like every week we're at least checking levels and noticing the trend in the battery. And uh, is, is that something everyone else is doing or? For How gas, you... we, we check um, we check voltage and oxygen every day. Every day, yep. It's like a 100-mile drive for us to do that, so we do it <laughs> once a week. <laughs> <laughs> our, our radio is beamed um, back to our server, so they're all radio-based, but I can do it from anywhere I have internet. Nice. So it's weekly, weekly check. Yeah, with only four Obels, I can keep track of that kind of stuff just through uh, communicating with the laptop. Um, and with these, and you know, I just Jasper just takes care of it all for me. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> Very different, you know. Uh, your 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 challenges with uh, pass or MMD or whatever, I I I, I can relate to on a smaller level. And can I, you know, a good shout out for Brandon. I think he's tried and hard. And I think it's he's, it's been a tough position for him to be in, um, but I think it's getting a little better. It's not great, but I think it's getting a little better because the customers are demanding it. And so, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with those guys. You know, and it's been good that the customers were talking. You know, like we're like, hey, are you having trouble with the grabber on the Obelix? Yeah, I'm having trouble. Like, you know, oh, yeah. so that's that's been good. So like these like these forums where we can collaborate have been like really helpful i think so that we can um have one voice with MAD has been helpful too so absolutely um well unless anyone wants to add anything else on that i will move on to another question and maybe matt i could throw this your way to start um for a newer operation just because you're going through the processes for mapping, et cetera. For a newer operation that hasn't accumulated much historical data yet, is it enough to rely on mapping and modeling to determine placements or is it worth waiting more time to get on the ground observations? Guess it all depends, you know, on your train. How some, some tower locations, some tower placements are pretty obvious and easy and others are super hard. Uh, until you start walking that terrain, terrain and figuring it out, you'll never know. And if you're confused, you know, there's resources, uh, uh, you know, consultants you can hire to come look at your terrain who've, who've put in, who've consulted other, you know, DOTs and other ski areas and, and um, can figure out where these things need to go or can help you figure it out. Um, you know, as much as much as you can try to do uh, LIDAR scans after, or even photogrammetry scans um, at your height of snow. Plus, obviously you need the, the bare earth one. So before the snow pack, and then during the season, um, during big events where you do have big fractures, um, those are good to get scanned in and height of snow to see where things build. 
And then if you can spend the money, you know, the flow analysis helps you determine where your towers may get ripped out, but it also helps you also can give you some idea of your impact down at the base. Like on the railroad, we learned that, you know, which towers were, which targets were most likely to hit the rail without connecting wall to wall. So there was one target that I was thinking I might not need a tower there. And it turned out that was the only target that um, could reach the rail uh, at, at a smaller snow amount, just the way the configuration of the terrain and how it, it didn't take the turn the rest of them did. So I ended up putting a tower there. So um, I think the money spent on the front end isn't cheap, but it's better than doing it wrong. Great answer. Thank you. Um, so Sean Zimmerman Wall has asked, how has the scoping, permitting, and approval process is, with land managers gone for the respective panelists when installing these systems? Um, I think it's probably different for every single state and group, but does any anyone have a quick and dirty of yeah, it's painful. Um, <laughs> you know, like the it's not just one forest service district in Colorado, right? Like you go over this mountain pass, different forest service district, different management, and you've got to re-educate everybody. So we have yet to like crack the nut of getting a statewide permit. Um, and so it's just it's just part of the process. I've, I've had pretty good luck with the forest service here in Alaska. Um, it took a while, but it was a 20 year permit. So that's okay. I'm kind of locked and loaded now for a while, but it, it was good. And then I'm getting some funding from the FRA and they have their, their own list of things they need. So the, the, the land use permit wasn't too bad, but the, the FRA needs um, for, for the funding for the grant is, is, is a whole new thing that I wasn't prepared for. Are you running into issues with wildlife? Like, hey, you got to fly a helicopter during these certain windows and not during lambing season or yep. nesting birds and yeah, us too. Yeah. Uh, Mostly around uh, helicopters is the big know, thing for us. Yeah, that that's a good point. I can't fly uh, basically between October 1st and June 15th. And I, I kind of worked it into the uh, permit where, you know, when I really need to heli bomb or go, go grab a tower um, for maintenance, I can do it, but I need to ask, you know, I need to actually call them up and talk to them about it. It's just not go ahead and do this, but uh, I'm able to fly if I really need to, but I'm not just allowed to, to fly whenever I want. The, the regulatory environment in California has been uh, pretty tough to navigate. Um, the reason we're all GAZX is because it's all on private property and we had to just get building permits to build them and we'll need building permits if we go to um, blaster boxes and Wiesen Towers, which we'd love to do, but we're up against it with the state of California with Cal OSHA. Um, I know there... Um, the ATF now is pretty much on board with how we could um, store explosives in these in these remote control systems. But uh, with California, the Office of Mining and Tunneling has their has their say when we're dealing with explosives for avalanche mitigation. So that's what we're. That's why uh, California is pretty much on a pause right now for any other system. And then and then with uh, Palace as it pertains to. Palisades, you know, we're all on private property. Where the gas X's are is on private property. So we were able to, you know, we didn't have to go through a forest service permitting process with NEPAs and all that stuff. So, but they are, the forest service is on board in the future with other systems that are on their land. But we'll, uh, as you guys all know, I'm, I'm sure you guys could talk about the cost of that, what it actually costs for uh, those studies. But that's something else to think about when you're operating on forest service land. Yeah, I think for us is, you know, a uh, credit to Grom, you know, you got to get up, get up early and get started early. And, um, 
I have a good relationship with your agencies, the Forest Service and the ATF, which we do. And uh, just, you know, tell them it's for, you know, worker safety. And that's always a big, you know, a big win. But I think to Dave's credit, he just gets started early in the permitting process and it all works out so far. Great. <clears throat> From Mackenzie Miller is the question, do any of you ever experience an inability to operate these systems, especially the VEASAN and blaster boxes due to rime ice or icing in general? Not much rime in Colorado, luckily. <laughs> Has not been a problem for us. Keep that shit on the West Coast, Ken. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a... Uh... I'm still pretty new here, only been here five years, but so far I haven't ran into a, I have not run into a rhyming issue with the blaster boxes. And I think it's because we're, all my stuff's just kind of one small uh, range, uh, ridge in from the, the coast and it's down a little lower in elevation. So I think it could be a problem, but I, I haven't experienced it. I'll maybe speak to that really quickly. Our two Ovalexes have experienced icing problems. Um, MND does say there's a fix for that though. So we have some older models, so perhaps that's no longer an issue. No, that is true, Larry. I did forget about that. Um, we did have a little bit of that, the, the icing up of the igniter. Yeah, fair enough. They'll sell you a new one for $25,000 though. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the it's new almost shower free. Head, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> the new shower head that mixes the gas is only twelve grand. So you know. Yeah, and they recommend you upgrade. So. <laughs> yeah, happy. <laughs> um, there is a question relating to, <clears throat> excuse me, data about misfire stats in racks. Um, do you guys have any stats about misfires in your racks? Jamie might. I mean, we. I'd have to uh, look at the numbers. I don't yeah. have it offhand, but. Any general impression? I, I think. I think for us in California, um, at least at the Palisades part, uh, the misfires happened. They were all attributed to creep issues. Um, and we haven't had any lately. You know, it's once we identified those issues. You know, it, it's pretty easy to tell when a when a three meter doesn't go off. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, not, I wouldn't say it's like, I would say that we probably have more, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't, I would just call them misfires, not not many, not not like we would have say in, um, probably have more, more duds with avalanchers than we've had with racks. The failure Definitely. to fires have been with, uh, um, you know, mechanical issues that you could troubleshoot you, like a buried gas X, you know, like it's buried, it's gone, you know, or out of oxygen. You know, so. But I think that that still counts as a misfire, even though you know what it is. Yeah. It makes sense to you. It still counts. I think Lori, this question, I, I would kind of throw back at you because I remember Mark Sauer kind of adding it all up when I was there with, with you in little cottonwood and, and we added up all the misfires, even if it was our fault, operator error. But uh, it seemed like it was higher than it should have been. Do you remember or do you know what it is? I don't have that exact number. Um, they're not 100% by any means. Um, and I think, Ken, you definitely touched on it. A lot of that can be environmental, but that still counts, you know, whether it's snow creep or um your exploder is buried or there's a mechanical issue or you have bad fuse in your vsin you know these are all things that you these things happen um and i think some seasons we've had we've definitely had a higher than average misfire rate this year uh because of some variables other years you know we did a test last year with a bunch of groupings with the vsins and we shot 69 rounds um or 69 emulsion shots from the v and the space of about an hour and we had one dud 
and that was because the emulsion blew apart and didn't ignite so and and i would say i'd much rather search for a problem on a rack than an avalanche around yeah or an uh, artillery round or a... <laughs> <laughs> sure i guess that's something to consider too right like what's your protocol if it's if it's a gazex misfire you know there's nothing to search for if it's a vsin misfire you know where do you have to go what's your protocol so that's do you just leave it like an artillery round or do you have to go up there and, and search immediately We don't have a protocol. If we can get there and do it safely and recover it, we'll try, but it's not in safe places to go to. That's why yeah. we put them there. Yeah. It's not comfortable, is it? Not comfortable, no, but we have done it. I'll try to go get them when there's still snow on the ground because with the, the reco, <laughs> reflector in it it's a lot easier for me to find than when it's uh when it's melted out and there's willows yeah, yeah. i'd say that's i'd say it's the same for us although we have only had one dud in our whole season we haven't really you know we're only starting this so we don't have you know a lot of missions yet to start racking up the duds like the avalanche program which i would say we have very little duds with anymore So I think for this next question, this has been touched on a bit, but uh, maybe as a comparison, if you're thinking of transitioning from a howitzer program to a RACS program, what is an average cost of installation of a system once environmental permit hurdles are overcome and a yearly cost to run a system, including people, hour maintenance versus traditional costs of running a howitzer and ski patrol bombing slash charges, people, hours, insurance. So maybe if anyone has kind of a cost comparison well for one thing no one is getting into the howitzer game well you no know. <laughs> so um howitzers are so much less expensive than any of these systems at two hundred fifty thousand dollars just for an install plus maybe anywhere from 15 to forty thousand, or colorado's a hundred thousand dollars in heli time um and just generic, you know, if you look at um, labor costs of probably thirty thousand dollars a year, you know, you know, add those up. Um, howitzers are way cheaper, but they're going away. So I don't know if that answered the question. It's just you know, we're, yeah, we're, everyone's moving away. We're we are we are mandated by the army to move away from howitzers. So. These 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 systems are expensive. They're they're not one hundred percent vetted. It's going to take time. Where I think this form is a, an amazing way to get us all together and and talk about the issues that they all have. Um, all you smart people out there, start thinking about other ways to come up with you know safe ways to mitigate avalanche hazard, and you'll be the next gazillionaire. But we'll uh, we'll keep plugging away. Yeah, they're like an Italian sports car. If you got to ask, you can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I always say if if I was to get these, you know, a rack system for free, it would still cost me a whole lot more to run my program just, you know, from the to load them up and do the maintenance. Um, I, I went through some numbers real quick today. But and these are kind of just guesstimations. Um, well, some of them are pretty pretty accurate but you know heli time for five vsin towers for a year you know including with no reloads but the initial fly up and fly down um i was thinking about uh eleven thousand the charge containers with the explosives in them you're about uh close to 9500 uh maintenance is uh about six thousand you got a software license which is cheap 300 bucks um, so the grand total for five Eastern Towers is $26,890. And you divide that by five, and it's $5,400 per tower, just to give you some numbers to chew on. Does that sound 
close. That's great. You did, Matt. I, I, I can't give you those numbers right off the top of my head. It's a quarter million dollars to put one on the ground, put one yeah. up. That's pretty, pretty accurate, I think. You know, and then from there, plastic charge containers, 95 bucks a piece. And then, you know, you get the shots for about 50 bucks and 60 bucks. Um, all the guys I have doing the work for me, we're paying them anyhow the work. So it's just, you know, what they're doing that day. Um, and, you know, the Healy's about 2,500 bucks an hour. So your numbers are probably pretty close. Yeah, I mean those those sound like my numbers I want yeah. off of Jersey. Yeah, that's that's lots of money. But I'm you know, I'm glad to see the howitzer go. I mean, we've been dealing with the duds up here in Alta for years and with everybody crawling around on the mountain 24 hours a day, blowing up howitzer duds isn't really any fun anymore. Um it's 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 pretty risky, I think, to, to deal with that anymore. So I'm I'm glad that that's we're not having to deal with that anymore. For sure. All right. How about for those of you that have installed some racks, one, have you ever dealt with an avalanche problem where you wished you had installed a different type of rack due to reach, type of load, et cetera? And two, what type of avalanche scenario do you find the most challenging to properly handle with racks compared to previously used mitigation? methods anyone have a thought on either of those i mean i think racks work awesome you know i'm a big fan of the air shot yeah. and uh for prying out some of these things that scare me the deep slab or the stubborn slab especially so compared i mean the howitzer projectiles what uh what is it eight pounds of explosive you know uh, avalanche rounds two couple pounds um Getting that shot up in the air makes me feel a lot better about some of these things, especially the deep slab issue. So uh, I think the racks work awesome. I really do, you know, as long as they work. Um, so a bit of a caveat there, but, but uh, you know, we talk a lot about where we put them, where we locate them. And it's not so much the type of, I think the type of rack is, is a little bit tricky. Um, mostly just like how you want to maintain it or what, what the access is. And so I think they all work pretty awesome, but, but, uh, and we talk a lot about with avalanche problems, anyhow, about like where we're going to put it like, Oh, well, this is like, we're almost always shooting this thing for storm snow. So we just want to get the snow coming off the trees and off the cliffs. And like, we just want the flush and like, let's just, let's just get it here and it'll be good enough. And then for like the bigger, the bigger terrain, um, a little more thought goes into where we put this thing, you know, and, and that's tricky. I find that to be pretty challenging and like trying to wrap my head around where we put it and like how the explosive um, shockwave is going to work. And there's not a lot of ways to go measure that. Or, I mean, there is, but we're, we're not, we're kind of just maybe diving into that as a next step for how we use that to, to uh, place these things. So. Yeah. And with climate change, you know, the avalanche problem is not always the same anymore. Keep that rain in California, please. <laughs> but that's that's a good point too. But the air shot works great in wet snow compared to putting it in the snow too, right? So I, I guess I I just like having it in the air. That's just I just really 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 like that. Yeah, I, I think for us the the issue is is cost. I I would love to see them all over. I'm totally with you, Jamie. Uh, the what you get out of these racks. You know, I don't know so much about the avalanche guard because that's putting it in the snow, but Weeson and those three meter gas X, I mean, that is a wallop. I agree. Do you guys have any opinions on, uh, you know, the explosives types? Did you deal much with the emulsions versus the penalite, et cetera? My biggest thing with the emulsion was like the shelf life issue and the um and the fact that you're kind of poking hole in it and then if you didn't shoot it now you got to like deal with all these uh, it's just that was my biggest issue with it but but the the that 11 pounder is real it's like that thing um yeah more of those it's, <laughs> it's awesome 
So <laughs> yeah. I will I say, think... Lori, the the emulsion we used to use in uh, the the tower at, in Cardiff Bowl was not impressive. Um, so I'm glad to hear people going to this 11 pound penalite charge and, and sounds like it's working really well. For 60 bucks, 11 pounds of penalite. Yes. Sign me up. I'm like, let's drop them out of helicopters. Let's do like, I'm like, let's put them everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, the emulsion, uh, we have some data on it from that overpressure study and I'd have to go back on it, but it, I don't think it was, it wasn't that impressive. Like Matt no. said, it's, it's not that impressive. No, you're, you're remembering correctly for sure. And, you know, even when we had some older stuff that had been out for a couple of years, one of our towers, you know, was detecting a shot that was 50% it was considered 50%, you know, the size of the blast that it was expecting. So I think that speaks to that. Um, what do you guys think about the binary in terms of that's supposed to be more like the emulsion versus the penalite? Yeah, Cappy. The, the only thing I thought about the binary that could be an interesting thing is like, you know, there are some table at distance things with the VSIN and maybe the binary would help us get around that, mm. you know, like distance from a road, distance from a lift, maybe now the binary, right? Like the binary is not, um, well, isn't it inert until it mixes, right? So, so maybe there's a, there, maybe there's an advantage there in the right place, but it's like, I don't know anything like, about the performance. Yeah. It's like all these uh, racks are all, they're all a tool. So that binary actually probably is a great tool uh, in the right spot, you know, like you're saying, Jamie, with the table of distances, but I don't have that problem in Alaska. So I'm not, I'm not getting any. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something to consider, right? It's a tool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's good for some people. Well, uh, maybe we'll do one. I mean, these right here. You know, these things are, you know, this is a nerd. <laughs> this is it. I will tell you that it takes a lot of room to store a bunch of these. You get three in a box. A lot and, of packaging. Uh, they fill up a ton of packaging. They fill up our cash pretty quick. But, uh, you know, they get the job done. <laughs> well. Maybe one last question. Um, and this one was kind of directed at you, Jamie, if I can find it. And that was asking, you know, how do you, so you actually take your towers down as well? No, 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 no. Yeah. just the boxes. Okay, copy. Um, so how do you store those? And then of all of the racks that you use, um, which has had the greatest success rate per button push, no glitches, mechanical problems, software problems, et cetera. Um, uh, so the VEASAN towers, we just fly them down, we put them on a plastic pallet and we, we put them inside a shop or inside a Connex for the summer, basically. Take the overhead kind of bar off. And, yeah, you do uh, take, and take that off. Take yep, that yep, we take that off and then we can stick them in a Connex. And those like just a nice plastic pallet, basically something a little more robust. We only have five, so that and then where we operate with those, like we have a C dot maintenance barn right there, we can stage out of. So we basically like fly them, land them in the parking lot, into the Connex. It's a good setup. Um, I've had you know all these systems have their quirks. I, I haven't had a perfect success rate with any of them. Um, uh, we have the most of the Gazex and the Obelexes right now. Um, you know, honestly, we work really hard to make sure these things are gonna work. And and so, and, and when they don't work, we like, we go fix them, like like day of next day, like we, we work really hard at it. So uh, um, the, the things that are frustrating is like the Gazex with all the plumbing and the fittings and like chasing leaks and like tearing something down and trying to fix it and then put it back together at 12,000 feet in a snowstorm, like it really sucks. Yeah. And, uh, and, and um, 
uh, uh, you know, Brian Gorsuch works for me and he works really hard to keep this stuff like working. And we like, we take it really seriously and we just, we just like try and keep it running. And we've, we've had a really good season, but it's not, <clears throat> it's just like the, how it's, I think it's a lot like the howitzer program, like all the things that go on behind the scenes before that bullet goes down range that people don't see is like a huge effort. And, and it's just like that with racks and, um, and we've had to, we've had some learning things with the visa and we've had, we've had some issues with our avalanche guard that have been like really tricky troubleshooting. We had some stuff get struck by lightning and like smoke a bunch of electronics. That was a huge pain in the ass. And, and so, so I don't know how to answer that question right now. I don't know if I ever will, but, but they all have their quirks. They're a great tool, but like, like we, we work really hard at it. We take it really seriously and we just, we, they got to work. So we just, we just make them work whatever that and whatever that takes if that's if that means we got a jb weld this damn plumbing fitting because there's no other way we found to fit it fix it that's what we're going to do and so um it could be a comedy of errors sometime with all the leaks with the gas x but like we we've made it happen and just um keep keep chugging away here so well put anyone have anything they want to add to that All right. Well, um, thanks, you guys. And there's a few questions left, but uh, Janie is going to <clears throat> collect them. And uh, you have her email, I believe. So we could respond to those via email. I'll turn it over to you, Janie. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to share my email in the chat. So if you have a burning question, um, that you really want answered. If you email me, I will make sure it gets to the panel and they can uh, get an answer for you. Uh, let me put that in right now. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, the entire panel. Does anyone else have any parting words? I mean, there are, there's still so many questions to be answered and it was such a good conversation. Does anyone want to end on any uh, specific notes? I think we should just keep keep the dialogue going you know this is the best way um you know we we've had a lot of good success with a unac i don't know if there's a way to you know to have a, a working group with racks you know a lot of us all know each other really well but um the conversation going you know and this was great thanks for facilitating this yeah i agree it's great to hear other people's stories and experiences for sure I had to see my old buddy, Matt. I haven't seen him in a long time. Good to see you too, Pete. <laughs> Matt, anything, any last words from Alaska? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not the best, the best uh, note to walk off on, but I would say plan, plan on these not working at some point, you know, build that in. There's a lot of questions about what's your, how, how what's your redundancy or, or what do you do when they don't work? And, uh, there's not an easy answer to that, but plan on plan on them not going boom at some point. And what are you going to do then? That's a good one. Uh, Jamie, any last words of wisdom? Um, I, no, not really. Good to see everybody. Good discussion. I think I can. I think these things are really valuable. Like keeping the conversation going about these things, learning from each other kind of all in this together and um you know if it was up to me i'd just build snow sheds and snow supporting structures everywhere <laughs> but uh i don't have a checkbook for that so i guess i'm stuck with these damn racks <laughs> awesome well thank you all and thank you Lori, to you in particular for facilitating this conversation getting this group together kind of building out how this conversation would go so thank you so much um, and thanks just for sharing all of your expertise with the A3 community. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, um, in particular, MND and VSIN, who you've heard a lot about tonight, our supporters of A3. So we are really grateful um, to have their support, and we appreciate it. Uh, I also want to let you guys know, the audience listening, that these webinar topics can be driven by you. So we're going to send out a survey 
uh, with requests for webinar topics for next winter. So if there's something that you want to hear about more or people you want to hear from, uh, please uh, engage with that survey and fill it out and provide us your feedback. We will absolutely take it to heart. Uh, and then the last big update for everyone is just that the ISSW registration is now open for BEND 2023. So if you are interested in attending ISSW, it is a significant cost and it is cheapest now. So if you register before the, I think it's mid-June, the price goes up. So check the ISSW website. I think it's ISSW2023.com. Um, and you can get your registration in and there will be, I think, some really great conversations and presentations potentially on RACS at ISSW. So thank you everyone again for joining us uh, this evening and have a great rest of your week and thank the weather that this worked out and you all were able to be here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. See ya.